All right. Welcome to section 340 of CST 8215. Uh, you guys are the add-on section. Your section was created three weeks ago. Uh, that's how many students we got. So at least five full sections of students. Um, you're, you, you, you're, you're lucky you got you're a small group, which means there's less, there's more chance to interact and less compared to the other group, which I have 120 students in my other section. So. Now, I'll give you the intro about me. Wow, that's small font. Gotta hate this room. Um, that's okay. All right, I'm a college graduate, like you all hope to be. Um, I graduated in 96. Uh, I don't have a university degree. Not that it should make a difference after working for over 20 years in the industry, but just saying. You know, I'm a college graduate, so I know exactly where you guys are and where you're planning to go. Um, if I remember right, you guys are CP students, computer programmer students, right? Okay. My other group's the CET students. So I have to target the info slightly differently, and I'd just like to confirm who it is I'm talking to at the start of the term. Um, I've been working as a professional developer ever since I graduated from school. Um, going through school, I kept telling myself that I'm not going to do anything with databases ever, to the point where I Almost failed my Oracle administration course. Mercy pass on that one. Um, however, that having been said, give, I'll give you three guesses what my very first job out of school was. Database. Second job? Database. And that's all I've done ever since. Sort of. <laughs> I'm technically a professional web developer. I write web apps. That back to databases. So I'm what they call a full stack developer. In other words, I know everything from the front end all the way to the back end. And I, I know how everything integrates. So I know the pros and the cons of the different technologies and stuff. Uh, I currently work for a company called Catholic Technology Corporation. Uh, some of you may have heard it. Some of you may not have heard it. Um, my, in my other section, I've got a student in my group that actually did a summer co-op as a high school student at our company, which is kind of weird. I've seen him before. Um, we're a company nobody's almost ever heard of. Very niche. Uh, we have like 50 employees, 60 employees worldwide. Uh, we make software for sign makers. If you don't know what that means, you know every time you're driving down the road or taking the bus, see big billboards. Odds are it was probably there's a 50 50 chance it was designed with our software and printed with our software. Or you look at the side of one of those uh, OC Transpo buses that's been wrapped. There's a good chance it's our software that did that. Uh, we're the market leader. We actually control 60% of that market. Small company. Small market, so we have to be really good at it and control it. Um, okay, so what kind of person am I? Now, anybody who's ever met me before will be able to tell you I'm fairly loose and easygoing, um, uh, which also means I have a very loose teaching style. Um, I'm not very formal. That's life. Um, I've been told that I'm sarcastic. And my daughter told me to update this slide and translate that word to savage. Uh, or the burn master, I've been told, by one of her friends. After I roasted her entire group of friends once. Without even noticing I was. I apparently crushed a bunch of 15-year-olds' egos. Uh, but that's okay. If they don't survive that, they're not tough enough. Um, I... That being said, I understand that life happens. If life interferes with your schoolwork, let me know. Probably not five minutes before something is due, because I make everything due at midnight. And the odds of me getting your email to exempt you at five to midnight, pretty small. Uh, by that, I mean, I've actually seen someone whose dog went and ate their homework and then threw up on their laptop. Literally. They took a picture to prove it to me. So what could I say? They came in laptops and smelled like dog vomit. There was no lying about what happened that day. Um, so if something bad happens to you or life happens or whatever, if you've got kids and they're puking all night and you can't make it to class, that's fine. I don't worry about it, which means I don't take attendance, just so you know. Um, however, I don't suffer fools. In other words, 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, uh, what's the difference between being dumb and being stupid? Dumb is something you're born, stupid is something you choose to be. Right? You can be dumb to be the hardest worker in the world and still succeed. Or you can YOLO, which is a phrase almost nobody says anymore because they've pretty much exterminated themselves. There's a reason people don't say that anymore. Um, and apparently I'm also not equal opportunity offender. Um, there's a good chance we'll get picked on. Don't worry, I'm going to pick on the person next to you next time. Don't take it personally. Uh, that having been said, if I see anything that really offends you, let me know either right away, and I'll take criticism in public, or meet me after class, and I'll make a point to try not to say that again. Whatever it is I might have said. In my last 10 years of teaching, I managed to offend one person enough to talk to me after class. And I still don't understand what would piss them off 10 years later. <laughs> but that's okay. I made a point to never use that example again. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, the other thing. Because I work in industry and I don't do part-time, I tend to have a bit of a potty mouth. I do apologize now. Occasionally, I'll say a bad word. We're all adults. We've all heard these words. Uh, if you've watched any recent movies, you've heard every single word I know. So we're pretty good there. Which leads me to the whole textbook clusterfuck. There's the first bad word of the, the term. The narrative is from my, my management, they're saying, you guys did not get charged for the textbook. The teacher in charge of the textbooks, which is not me, says you got charged for your textbooks. Right now, unless you have a in detailed invoice that shows the cost of all your books, because some of you have been and some of you have not been charged. And that's where the mess is, because we don't know who's been charged and who hasn't been. Apparently, there's $209 of excess charges on some people's in the tuition. So we, uh, but basically, the narrative is: check your invoice in detail. If you see any textbooks listed on there that aren't supposed to be there, that's when you go ask for for a refund. How do you know what textbooks you've been charged for and you don't have? Look at your course outline. There'll be some textbooks listed in there. Now, specifically for this course. The textbooks that you should not have been charged for, because these are um, not e-texts. Uh, book number one, Relational Database Design and Implementation by Dan Harrington. That is the book I am re semi-requiring you to have. It's put down as a recommended textbook. And considering I'm asking you guys to read nine chapters of that book by the end of the term, it's up to you if you want to read it or not. Um, is it going to be helpful? Yeah. Uh, I figure if you're going to pay for a textbook, you sure as heck better read it. Uh, at least that's my philosophy of assigning textbooks to people. Um, that being said, uh, it's a very good book. It's all plain English, fairly easy to understand. Uh, they don't tend to use a lot of big words, which is great. Uh, unlike the textbook that we used last year, and if anybody's ever seen that textbook, it makes them want to cry. Um, because it's the same textbook I used when I was in school. I used the second edition. They were using the 12th. It even still had the bad, same sad Star Trek jokes in it. That's how much it didn't change. And it was full of big up, made up words that didn't actually mean anything. Uh, what this book covers in two paragraphs, the other book would do in three pages. Uh, and those two paragraphs are plain English. And actually, I've had students that have seen this book. Because uh, I talked through the summer and they looked at this book. No problem. And uh, they read the explanations. They said it's almost word for word what I said in class. And I had never seen the book until two days before that. So it's actually pretty decent. Uh, so this book going by. At the bookstore, apparently it's about 90 bucks here at the school. If you're lucky and you manage to get it off Amazon, it's 53 bucks, 70 to 8 bucks at Indigo. Uh, if you buy it from Amazon, you can get it as a Kindle book. So if you have Kindle, the sad handful of you that use it, you can get an e-copy of it. Or if you know where else to go look, you can probably find an e-copy somewhere that you can buy. Um, book number two, PostgreSQL up and running. I'm telling everybody to hold off on buying it. Don't go rush out and buy it now. It's a great book. I don't know how much of it I'm going to use, so I don't know if it's worth your money. The other book is the important one. This one here's a companion piece for the labs. 
And most of my labs are written in such a way that you don't tend to need this. So because there's five sections, there's, that means there's four teachers, and they use books differently. Uh, so if you've bought it, good job. If you haven't bought it, don't buy it yet. If you've bought it, share it with someone. Get them to pay half for the book. Um, okay. Dan's rules for success in this course. Come to lecture. However, as I said earlier, I don't take attendance. Uh, there's a reason for that, which I will be explaining, I think, in one or two slides. Uh, rule number two. Do your work. This is in high school. Um, if you don't do your work, I don't care. You make my life easier. It means I don't need to grade anything. Three, hand in your work on time, which leads me to do your work. If you handed it on time, you can achieve up to 100% of the grade. If you are one week late, I'll take up to one week late. So it's due Monday at midnight, and you don't meet that deadline. You have until the next Monday at midnight to just hand it in, but you get a 10% penalty. I'll give you two guesses what happens at um, Tuesday, you know, one minute after midnight. You get zero. And essentially the rule is if you get a zero on an assignment, you don't get to do it again. You don't get to say, well, you know, I couldn't. You've had two chances to tell me something went wrong. Just putting it out there. Um, because I teach part-time and I work full-time, the amount of time I have to sit there and create new assignments for people doesn't exist. Um, if this number four is an add-on, because Blackboard used to play games with my due dates, randomly would set them back six months in time. It doesn't do that anymore, but it did it for a little bit. It was a really fun term. Uh, if you don't hear me assign it in class, as in I'm standing here with my microphone and my camera, and there's no recorded evidence that I said to do this work, then it's not due. Okay? If I don't assign it, it doesn't exist. Fair enough. Now, uh, number five, I forgot to change the slide. The labs are actually due by the start of the next lab. I just, normally it's at the start of the next lecture, it's due at the start of the next lab. However, since I don't do the lab section for this group, uh, you guys have Cheryl. Her word is law. Fair enough, so whatever she says goes. Uh, and she and I agreed that it's this, you know, you've got that lab period plus a week to do your labs, so you know, show it or submit it by the start of the next lab. If she just says change the rules, that's up to her. Uh, we are each in control of our own classrooms, and she's in control of your lab section. Uh, she's very knowledgeable, uh, but she's also very new, so you know, please be kind. Um, and again, late labs are supposed to be an automatic zero. Okay, what can you expect this term? Uh, lectures, labs, assignment tests, and a two-part exam. This should be not a surprise. Well, maybe the two-part exam might be a surprise. Uh, lectures, this is what we're all doing here right now. Uh, labs is what you guys do with Cheryl, I think, on Thursdays. Uh, assignments. You get to piggyback with me and Cheryl for the assignments because I assign them in class, and then I actually have an assigned work period in the lab. So you have two different teachers to help you with the assignments. Um, tests. Tests are usually, did I actually have another thing on there? Yeah, I'll explain that in a second. And the two-part exam, the exam is split into a practical and a theory uh, practical and a theory section. There's a practical done the week before the theory exam, which means that the actual exam for this course actually got shorter, and you get to focus on each of the separate pieces individually. Uh, it's also designed to be fairer to students that are either A, really good at memorizing information, or B, really good at doing but suck at memorizing. Because essentially the way it works is you take the total of the practical exam, the total of the theory exam, add them up, and that's your final exam grade. So if you blow the, the practical exam, you, then you succeed fantastically at the theory, congratulations. You get the two exams put together and that's your score. Um, lectures are free form. I don't use lecture notes. These are my lecture notes. That's actually a big improvement over what I used to do. I used to come in with a sticky note and stick it to the desk uh, because I'm not a fan of PowerPoint. 
Uh, but I've learned to just have to accept it. There's a certain amount of content I need to do, and me giving you guys slideshows gives you the outline of what you need to know. So it's all fair. Um, labs are gradually peaking difficulty around week nine. So the labs do this and kind of level off. Uh, historically, I've managed to time all my labs and all my assignments so that they come and do either before or after everybody else's assignments and labs. So you'll have lulls in my course when you're at your peaks in the other course. Historically, I make no promises this time how it's going to go, but historically, I've always timed it so that my stuff's usually done a, due about a week after everybody, all the other courses stuff is due, so you don't get slammed with my material or with their material. It reduces the load a bit. Um, assignments are submitted by Blackboard. Every assignment gets two weeks to do. I hand it out, you've got two weeks to do it. Um, they're usually not killers. Therefore, there's usually not an excuse to not do your assignments. Uh, tests are online. I give you one entire whole week to do it. I release it at the end of, a, of the lecture of the week. You have until the midnight of the following week to do the test. So if it comes out Monday at 6, well actually, sorry, Tuesday at 7, your test will be due at midnight Monday. So you get whatever, six and a half days to do it. Um, historically, the tests take half an hour to an hour to do. I'm giving you seven days to do an hour test. If you don't do it, well, you know, too bad. <coughs> All right, lecture recording. I try. I make no promises. This is a value-added service. Uh, apparently, I'm the only prof in either CP or CT that actually does takes the time to do this. Uh, there's two reasons I do this. Well, three. For reason number one, if you're sick, don't come and infect everybody else. Just saying. You know, if you're sitting there and your lungs getting ejected on the person sitting in front of you, go home. Don't do it to us. Um, rule number two, reason number two, I don't need to do reviews, ever. Why? You've got the entire content of the course available to you via YouTube. Um, and reason number three, it gives me an alibi when I say I said to do something a certain way. I can go say, go to this video and look around the, you know, 45 minute mark, you'll find me saying do it this way. And I've actually caught myself in a lie once doing that, and then I had to actually take points, give people points. So it works as a checksum for both you and I. Um, normally, once they get recorded, I'll process them the next day when I'm sitting at my day job, because it takes hours to render. Then I upload it to YouTube, and then I post a link in Blackboard. Um, <laughs> no, I don't get paid for that. Um, it takes me about half an hour to prep the video to render. I put a title on it. If I notice I made any mistakes, you'll sometimes see me put a little triangle on the board off on a corner. That's because I made a mistake here or I said I need to add something like a note because I don't remember something. And you'll, I'll add it to the video. I'm using little marks on the board as my time marks. Do Am I going to put timestamps? No, not really. Um, that would take add hours to the preparation of the videos. And once it's rendered, I have to upload it to YouTube and then do the timestamps in YouTube. It's not in the editing software. And it's quite, you know, a lot of work. But the fact that, you know, best I can do is give you the videos and we fast forward through it. Uh, if you roughly remember what I covered based on the slides, you can just look at the slides as you're fast forwarding and you should be able to find yourself fairly quickly inside the video. Uh, the other reason that's great that it's on YouTube is you can watch it on your phone, on your tablet, on whatever that you want. Even that cool fridge they sell at Home Depot that has that Android screen built into it. All right. What will you be learning? Uh, you'll learn about basic database design terminology. You're going to be learning about SQL. Views, triggers, and stored procedures. That's towards the end of the term. That's the complicated stuff. But I need you guys to get through your basic programming stuff first. Otherwise, you know, I could do it earlier. Uh, and other stuff. Depending on how the term goes, I sometimes have room at the end. And I'll throw in a couple of value-added lectures. 
So depending how fast material gets covered, you know, it goes on. Uh, this is the slide that almost everybody cares about. This is your evaluation grid. Labs are worth 10%. Quizzes, also known as hybrids, are also worth 10%. Uh, in other words, if you decide to not do any of the hybrids, the best you'll ever get is a 90%, assuming you get 100% absolutely everything else. So, you know, you might want to do those hybrids. Uh, assignments are worth 20%. That means 10% each. Uh, the tests, there are two. They're 10% each. Uh, final exam for the theory is 20%, and the final exam practical is 20%. So when you look at your course outline, it says final exam 40%. 20 plus 20 is equal to, there you have it. All right, this is known as a 3-2-3 course. Uh, this is probably a term you haven't heard yet if you're new at this. 3-2-3 um, three, three means you get three hours of theory. Out of those three hours of theory, it's two in the classroom, one hour of hybrid. So that means you're, you've been allocated the equivalent of three hours a week for learning something. Uh, most of my hybrids are actually faster than that. So that hour that's reserved for hybrids really shouldn't even take you the hour. That's basically homework. Um, two hours of lab. That's when you get to spend your time with Cheryl on Thursdays. And three hours of study time. Three hours of study time is a vague number because some people don't need to study. Some people need to study more than three hours a week. It just depends on who you are. Um, Essentially, where I'm filing the three hours of study time is your reading assignments, um, because I give you guys a lot of reading to do. Um, the first reading assignment, the worst, it's going to suck, um, because I need to get you guys through the first X number of chapters in the book, which I will assign at the end of the class. Um, that kind of stuff. Now. The official statement of how to pass the course is, you must write the final exam. You have to get at least 50% on tests and exams combined. You have to get 50% on assignments and group work. Uh, that one's up to me how I interpret 50%. One of the other profs interprets 50% as being, you have to get at least 50% on every single one. The way I interpret it is, you have to get at least 50% on the total combined. So if you completely bomb the first assignment, but you do great on the second one, and you end up with like 51% combined total, good. Um, in the course outline, there's course-related information for more details. Uh, you are to submit both assignments in all labs. Um, essentially, if you don't submit an assignment, I give you a zero, and you know, then you need to at least get a 50%. Then you need to at least get almost 100% on your second one to actually make up for it, so that's basically, you know, decide not to do one, you've got to do the second one and do really well. Okay, what I'm going to do, before I go on any further, is give you guys the five cent tour of um, your Blackboard for this course, which I'm sharing with Cheryl. So it's a little weird, I've never had a, two teachers in one course before like this. Announcements, you know, uh, course information is where you're going to find your CSI and your course outline. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a CSI is, that's a document that discusses uh, what roughly you'll be learning on a week-by-week -week basis, what lab you're supposed to be working on, what hybrid you should be doing, what your reading assignment is for that week. It's all listed there week-by-week. -week. Um, it takes you by the hand and holds you through, so there should be no mysteries of what you're supposed to be learning on a given week. Uh, Course documents is where things are going to get pretty busy. PowerPoint presentations. There's a folder. In here right now, the first four weeks of slides are there, just so you know, uh, including the intro slideshow plus week one, two, three, and four. Um, I've got some tutorials and some other documents in here. These aren't important yet. The PowerPoint presentation is where you're going to care. Further down, Assignments, where you're going to find your assignments. Tests, where you're going to find your tests. Hybrids, where you're going to find your hybrids. You know, it's rocket science. Uh, labs under labs. Recordings. I'll give you three guesses what goes under recordings. The results of my little camera. Um, 
And the last one that you guys can't see right now is a practical exam. That will show up at just the right time. If it's basically put anything when I upload course documents, examples, samples, that kind of stuff is all going to end up in course documents, so you know. I'll create applicable folders and put the stuff in, in there. Okay. I through the first less the first the first week's lecture uh, because you guys are shorted one lecture because of uh, orientation day day one whatever it's called uh, basically put you end up getting screwed out of one lecture uh, which means that it makes it challenging for both you guys and me to keep you guys up to snuff so what I've done is I've taken the first two lectures and taking some of the stuff from lecture two moved into lecture one so that by the end of this week you're close to where my other group's going to be. So by the end of next week, you and all the other normal, all the regular sections should be on the same page now. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to start talking about uh, data versus information. Uh, the first lecture tends to be a data dump, an info dump, terminology. Uh, raw concepts, that kind of stuff. But it's all important. It's just kind of boring, um, such as life. So there's something called data and there's something called information. Data is unprocessed information. Those would be like a customer, of course, or an employee. They're building blocks of information. For example, if I look at everybody in here right now, you're all just blobs of data. You all have names. You all have some sort of identification number, whether it's a SIN number, passport number, visa number, whatever. You all have a student number. You all have a gender of some sort. You have ages, dates of birth, you know, countries of origins, addresses. Those are all data points. They're pieces of data. <laughs> They're not really information yet because it's all disorganized. I haven't taken the time yet to collect, collect all the data and turn it into information. On the other hand, information is created by processing the data. So that's as if I took a little form, handed it to each of you, and you all fill it all out, and then I take that information, put it in a structured storage space of some sort, whether it's a database or something else, and then I can actually extract, give me the list of everybody's first names. That's information, because it's been processed, it's useful. How many people in here are from Canada? How many are foreign exchange students? Or distance education, or whatever you call it, foreign exchange students. There's various ways of mining for data. And once you've mined the data and extracted useful chunks out of it, it becomes information. For example, a credit card statement is, inform is information. It collects all your transactions for the month, which are all individual pieces of data, collects it, puts it in a set format, and gives it to you. Now it's information. Uh, if you look at anything like, you know, how, depending how your uh, credit cards take a beating during the first couple of weeks of school, I'm sure that some of them might have a lot of transactions on them. And at the end of the month, you look at that and you're like, holy crap, five pages. It's been a bad day uh, when that comes due. But that's information. Your phone bill. Video rentals, like when you used to rent videos. But it's, I still use the example because most of us still remember renting videos at one point in our lives. Um, so when you go rent a video, they put the video on your account. They now have information that you have that video. It's useful information. Um, good information allows for accurate and timely uh, decision making. So if your information is up to date and it's kept up to date, that means decisions can be made quickly. Your statement comes in. You look at it and go, hey, I don't remember these 26 transactions. And why were they all in the state? Goddamn Equifax. Okay, somebody stole your data and they took over your credit card. You get on the phone to your credit card company, you start just computing, uh, you know, not arguing about the charges on your card. That is timely process because the data was given to you in a timely manner and it's useful. Um, good decision making is key for an organization's survival. If a company has bad data, they'll make bad decisions and then you end up like Nortel. 
where everybody was so worried about optics, they cooked the book and the company went under. Now, a little bit of a history lesson. Way back in the day, computers used something called a file system for maintaining its data. Uh, have, has anybody in here ever worked with an accountant or dealt with an accountant or seen the inside of an accountant's office? Okay, one, two. Um, they love their filing cabinets. They love their paper. They like folders. Um, and used to be that computer processing was very similar to that. You had entire directories full of files. And these files were organized in different ways where the sales department would have a folder with certain pieces of information. They'd create a new order and they'd either actually either print it out on paper and hand it to someone or they'd save a document down to a disk somewhere. And that was the order. And there could be customer information on that order form, what did they buy, that kind of stuff. But that information was totally detached from what shipping needed or it's totally detached from the accounting department needed. So there was always this big manual overhead to make sure your data worked right. So what would happen is the sales department would take an order, they accept payment, then they'd take that file and send it to shipping. Shipping would take that file, fill out their own, their own documents, save them down, and then ship the box. It was really manual, it was really terrible, and it was really prone to a lot of risks. Now, for example, you know the sales department would have the customer information because the sales department sold it to someone. The shipping department would have to re-enter the information about the customer into their own system. Actually, we're kind of dumb because where I work, we ship stuff all day, every day of the week, pretty much. And we still have to do dual entry because we're not tied into FedEx. Our old shipping system doesn't want to talk to FedEx. and It's very expensive work to do to make it work with FedEx. Um, management says it's not worth it yet. So we still got the point where the guy walks over his piece of paper across the room to the little FedEx terminal, types everything in, and a label comes out of the machine. Um, mistakes get made. So now at this point, there ends up being documents where there's several, several files everywhere. The sales department would have a file for customers, a file for products, product uh, files for their sales. The shipping department could have a customer file uh, some shipping documents. They'd have all kinds of documents, and none of them are actually connected. They're all sitting on the, on a disk somewhere. And there's problems with this. Can anybody take a guess what one of the problems might be? Anybody want to take a guess? Small groups, these these little kind of discussions will go fast. Nobody wants to take a guess what the problem might one of the problems might be. All right, we're going to talk about the problems on the next slide. Um, I do encourage discussion, so don't feel shy. I won't make fun of you. Yes? Yeah, they may not know the products. Um, one of their problems could be that they're made, both maintaining a customer file. So what happens if they're both maintaining a, maintaining a customer file? The information might go wrong, right? Somewhere along the way. Uh, for example, customer calls up the main switchboard, and the main switchboard needs to get the information about the customer. And they go, "Oh, this is my phone number." And then just what happens is that the person has a different phone number in the shipping department as opposed to the sales, because the sales might be the number for their accountant or the you know the 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 uh, purchase of pur uh, purchasing department at the other company. Shipping might be the phone number for the guy that's shipping at the other company. Or even better, if it's a company like ours where we take the order from one of our resellers and we ship it directly to our customer. I mean, we've got two totally different sets of information. We'd never know whose orders went to what if we didn't have an integrated system. Which leads me to data redundancy. The old systems, and this is the goal of proper database design, is to reduce data redundancy. The same data could appear in more than one location. You could have the same customer, both in shipping and in sales and probably in accounting, um, probably in tech support if you have a product that requires technical support. Uh, you can have data inconsistency. The guy misenters the data in shipping because, you know, the shipping guy might not be the sharpest tool in the shed. 
it's hard to type it in. Or like ours likes to type everything in with caps lock on because he comes from an old, used to work for a really old company here in Ottawa and they had to put everything up with case. And he never got out of the habit of having the caps lock key on on everything he does. So it looks like he's screaming every order. Now, because of that, you may not be aware of it because you know Windows isn't case sensitive. But if you've ever used certain kinds of computers, you'll discover that a lowercase a is not the same thing as an uppercase a. And when it came back to old data processing, that caused all kinds of problems. Uh, data anomalies when, uh, are things that happen when something goes wrong. So they've got a system that updates the data. And it does whatever it's supposed to do, like magic, because it's fantastic, right? Magic is good. Uh, but somewhere along the way, something goes wrong, and the data gets corrupted. And the next couple of slides, I talk about the different kind of corruptions that happen. And essentially, what happens is somebody goes change some data or add some data, and it doesn't finish the job. Anybody here ever work with someone that didn't finish the job, but you thought it finished the job? Group work, anyone? Like, really? We all had that one group work partner. Or if you work in the work environment, there's at least three guys in your company that, do that are like that. I'm not saying I'm not one of them. Okay, data anomalies. There's three kinds of anomalies when it comes to data. And this is even before I talk about database structures and the pieces of data. This is data anomalies. There's three kinds. There's modification, insertion, and deletion. Modification happens is when you're changing something that already exists. For example, um, you're filling out a piece of paperwork. And I'll use the lady's example for this one. You just got married and you changed your last name. But while you're filling out the form, because, you know, muscle memory, you put in your old, your original main name. And then five minutes later, you look the form, you go, ah, crap, I did it wrong. Scratch, put in your new name. But what you forgot is somewhere else on the form, you did the same thing twice, but you didn't catch it on the second one. So suddenly you have two different last names. That's a modification anomaly because you, up, you entered the data, then you try to change the data, and you, something didn't finish the job. An insertion anomaly. You're putting the data in, and it doesn't finish. It doesn't go in all the way. Uh, anybody here ever had the experience with not so much as much anymore, but it used to be pretty common? You go to a website, you type in your information, you hit save, you get to the next screen, half your information is missing. That used to happen a lot. Not that programmers didn't care, but we didn't care. Just make you type it in a second time. Your time is less important than ours. Um, and then the other one's the deletion anomaly, where you start deleting information, but you end up leaving orphans behind as little bits and pieces, crumbs left everywhere. It's like what's left on the counter after my daughter ra ravages the fridge. There's like chunks of strawberries and granola all over the counter, and it's like, what the hell happened? There's crumbs everywhere, but there's nothing left of the actual useful information. Um, but it's, you know, deletion anomalies. So now I'm going to talk about, it's going to do this to me. All right. I thought I caught all those slides where things pop up one at a time. A modification anomaly. That is when you change the data. Now, in this case, we're going to go change the address for employee number 519. If we change his address in this table, and some, for some unknown reason, we don't catch all the instances of his record, employee 519 now has two different addresses. Because this database, was badly designed, they're mixing their skills and their addresses into the same table. That means that if an employee has more than one skill, such as he's a carpenter that's good at talking in public, we have to update his address twice. When somebody was entering the data, they didn't notice right away, and they forgot to update his second address. Now, looking at this data, can you tell me which one is the right address? There's no way to know. So once the anomaly happens, you've got problems. A properly designed database, you only need to change that in one place. Thus, we want to avoid modification anomalies because it adds to confusion. It's noise. Um, it's extra. It's overhead. Somebody's got to take the time to fix things. And 
a deletion anomaly. I'm going to get after that one next because actually that one's fairly straightforward. Now, if we look at this little table, you see we've got two different faculty and three different courses. Dr. Giddens teaches English 206. Dr. Saperstein teaches Computing 101 and Computing 102. Let's just say if we decide that we want to no longer offer English 206 and we delete that row, we'll lose the fact that Dr. Giddens even exists in our faculty database. That's called the deletion anomaly. That means when you got rid of a piece of information, and as opposed to leaving crumbs behind, this one's like taking a shotgun to the data, where instead of just get deleting one small piece of information, you're deleting other information that you might want to keep. Or even better, Dr. Ginz gets turfed because he got caught with the intern. Suddenly, we do, Dr. Giddens is not someone you want to have at the school anymore because he's now registered. And we fire him. Now we no longer can offer English 206 because that course no longer exists in our database. Deletion anomaly. It's a bad thing. We don't want to do that. So a properly designed database would allow us to turf Dr. Giddens while not losing the fact that we offered a second level English course. Right? <coughs> uh, by the time you're done this course, you should understand that about how to not allow that to happen with proper design. Okay, now we've got the insertion anomaly. With the insertion anomaly, it's the other way around. Let's say we hired Dr. Newsom. We've got some new professor coming in, and we hired them. They don't have a course yet. Because maybe we hired them to get, so we could get rid of Dr. Giddens. But right now, Dr. Giddens has English 206. But and Dr. Newsom doesn't have any course. And, but the system requires that they both have an employee ID, a name, and a course. We can't add them in because we don't have all the information we need. Therefore, if you're not able to add the data into the database, that's an insertion anomaly. In other words, you're missing something. You need to try to avoid causing these problems. Anomalies are bad, obviously. In other words, to make a long story short, after you know the last five, eight minutes of talking, if you're unable to delete the data without losing something else, if you're not able to add data because you're missing something that realistically is relevant, or it requires multiple steps to update your data, it's bad design, it's a bad thing, Therefore, the goal is that I'm going to teach you guys to not set yourselves up for that kind of situation. These were all things that were common in the 70s and the early 80s, even late 80s. And you guys are saying, well, holy crap, that was so long ago. Actually, I bet you there's some people in here that probably weren't even born. <laughs> way, you know, way back then. But that was common, and we're still living some of these older systems. They're still around. Why? Because they don't die. They're like zombies of data processing. Why do you think everybody laughs about how COBOL is so terrible and COBOL is going to die? COBOL has been dying for 30 years. What's the best paid, paid computer programming job with the government? COBOL developer. Why? Because it works. And the systems are old and they're terrible, but they're still there and they work. Which brings me back to the file systems. Back in the day, then it's important to have this history lesson so you understand how things have changed. Programs are written to access the data. In other words, each program accessed the data. Each program controlled its data files. So if you had the guy in sales, he had a program that created sales orders, created invoices, created customers. It had its own little files, and it did whatever it needed to do. The shipping guy, ditto. He had his own little program that did the shipping for him. It maintained its own customer file, its own shipping information, but the product information might not have been in there, et cetera, et cetera. And 
if you needed to extract data assembly, we need to extract information for both shipping and sales. What would happen? You'd pay that poor guy in the basement to go write you a new program. And he'd write a new program so they could look up information in both places. And suddenly you got three programs to access two different data stores. It's a little redundant and it was bad. Um, the programmer controlled everything. How is the data located? How is it stored? How is it formatted? What are we allowed to put in? Et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's say you needed information out of a file that you don't really have access to. Can you get the information quickly? No. You either had to go walk over to someone's desk and ask them for the information, or you send a request down to the programmer so you could write you a new little, new little program. Um, this was really common in the old days. Um, when I was in school, this new technology called AS400 was coming out. Uh, probably no one in this room has ever heard of an AS400. Be thankful. Um, my other lecture section actually had a girl that started giggling when I said AS400, because apparently she's still using one at her part-time job. So she's still sitting there with this dumb terminal, tabbing through screens of information, and it's redrawn, you know, really old school. They're still around. Uh, but back then, if you needed information, you had to send a request to a programmer to actually write your new program to get the information out. Uh, you could, so basically, quick reports, strategic decision making, like, um, like what Walmart does in the States. It's fantastic. I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, this kind of stuff, real time decision making, never happened. Usually decisions were made at the end of the month or the start of the next month, because then they'd run these big processes and collect all the data, give it to management, they make some decisions. Business ran a lot slower. Things ex have accelerated significantly because you have access to data nowadays. Uh, the program has specific structure, and it was really complicated. Now, what would happen if you needed to add a new field? I remember when I used when I got my first co-op when I was in school. I worked for a company called Bort Longyear. Probably most of you have never heard of that company either, uh, but I'm sure some of you have heard about De Beers International. Anybody here ever hear of De Beers? Anybody anybody here got a diamond ring on? They control 90% of the world's diamonds. They have three. They own two thirds of the world's jewelry stores. The beers, uh, they're they're really bad people, in general. Uh, I know I shouldn't say that reported. I could get sued. Uh, but anyways, the Beers International is a huge corporation, and they have all these different companies, right? I worked for a company called Bort Longyear, and they were just rolling out a new, uh, a brand new system. And suddenly, this new technology came out. That was people are saying, "Hey, look at this! Our customer records. We're missing a field." And the accounts are just like, "What are you missing?" an email address. And they had to modify the new system they're rolling out and the old one to add an email field because they had three of their customers wanted to receive information by email. Like you gotta think this was like 94, 95. But email was almost non-existent. What would happen is you had to modify every single program that touched a customer record to now support an email field. It sucked. Every program had to be updated. What happens if we forgot about one program somewhere along the way? So the guy in shipping never got the fact that he's supposed to have an email field. And the funny thing is about these old systems were if a program's touching a file and it has a new piece of information in it and it doesn't know about it, it would read that file and rewrite the file without that information. Data would go away. Magic, but nobody would know why, it just went away. So somewhere along the way, somebody created a system called a database. Databases were great, and they're still kind of cool. It's not an exciting part of the industry, but it's a really important part of the industry. A database is a structure that contains logically related data in a single repository. OK, big definition. Here's what it means. Earlier I talked about how an accountant likes having a filing cabinet, right? That rings a bell? 
picture that as a single repository. Each top drawer is accounts receivable, second drawer is accounts payable, third drawer is payroll. Accounts receivable, accounts payable, and you have all the customers and all the orders and proper little folders. Technically, that's a database. It's not a usable database, but technically that's, you know, if you want to talk about the technical definition of a database, that's a database. Because it's logically related data, because it's all accounting information. And it's all in a single repository, that's filing cabinet. Now that's kind of ridiculous when we're talking about modern technology referring to the filing cabinet, but it's really pretty much that's what it was. Um, but nowadays, what they refer to that is, you have a database which contains a bunch of objects. I'll be describing what those objects is eventually. Maybe not tonight, but eventually. And those objects are all interrelated to each other. And they're all contained in a single bin. And a database contains a couple of different things. It contains data and metadata. And this is where I break up my markers for a minute. I need two colors. This is data. Can anybody tell me what these different pieces of data are? Okay, assuming divided like that. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, anybody want to take a guess? Okay, anybody want to take another guess? Yeah, exactly. So right now, as I said earlier, it's data. It's not very useful, right? Because you really don't know what these pieces are. They're just pieces. Now, databases have something called metadata. So you know when you fill out a form, you got all the different slots. It says first name, last name, you know, date of birth, SIN number, visa number, passport number, whatever, right? Each of the slots have a name. That's metadata. Uh, that, mind you, when you talk about metadata in a database, there's a lot more to it than just that. You're talking about what kind of data is it, you know, what format is it in, how much of it you're allowed to have, that kind of stuff. But at the most basic, and now. You know what exactly everything is. Why? Because I just provided you some metadata. So that's the big difference between what the file systems used to have and what databases have. The file systems would store the data like this. You'd have Dan Cobbler 75. That's all that was in the file. You had no idea what any of it was unless you looked at the program, decompiled the program, and looked at what each of the slots meant. And if you suddenly added a new column, you had to update every single file to make sure that all the data was there. The database, on the other hand, will store metadata. In other words, it says everything that's in this slot is a name. Everything in this slot is an occupation. Frank's not very clever. He's a brick. You know, Dan's a cobbler, and Dave's a sampler. He spends his life trying things. I don't. Know. And they're year of birth: seventy-five, eighty-three, and fifty-five. Right. So these numbers meant nothing, really, absolutely nothing to you until. You know, we, I provided you some relevance. I mean, a name is a string. In other words, it's all numbers and letters. The occupation is also a string. 
And this one's a number. In this case, it's an integer. So that's metadata. I'm describing, I'm giving you what it is and what kind of format it's in. Yeah, me saying things like an integer and a string is probably very right now because you haven't gotten there yet in programming class. However, a string is basically alphanumeric, name, numbers, and letters. And an integer, if you don't know what an integer is and you're in your first year of college, I think you need to go take an introductory math course. An integer is a whole number with no decimal places. Well, the, the, the top part, I'm using that as an example of metadata. And metadata basically describes the different pieces of the data. So in the database, not only, yeah, it's what's across the top in this example. Realistically, in the database, it's not at the top. It's somewhere else. Um, but in the database, not only do you have the data, you've got data about the data. So you've got some data that describes each of the different data pieces. So for example, if I asked everybody in here to on a piece of paper, put down your name, address, phone number, email address, year of birth. And I didn't tell you what order to put it in. It would all come out to me scrambled, right? On the other hand, if I told you guys, write down all that information, but while at the same time, write down next to what that data is, I'll be able to work with it because you told me what it is. So that's what the metadata in the database does. You've got a, you've got a bin. Inside this bin, you've got raw pieces of data, and there's some other data that tells you what these pieces of data are. It sounds really convoluted. But essentially, it's exactly what I just did here, where I've got data, and then you can picture this as being data about the data. So this is information about this information. And sometimes you can't have information about something else until you have information about that thing. Um, now, and I do promise this is the worst lecture. <laughs> it gets a lot better after this. But here's the difference from the old database versus the file system. Just so you know what the big difference is. In the database, everything's contained in one big bin. You got a, something called a database management system that sits in front of it. The database management system, the database management system takes care of letting people talk to the database. Usually there's something else sitting right in front of it here, but for simplicity's sake, people connect to the database management system, the database management system deals with the data. What used to have to happen is the sales department would have these three files, the personnel department would have that file, accounting department would have this file, and then shipping would have you know, this plus its own set of files. So each department had its own data. And if anybody here's ever worked in the government, Anybody here ever worked with anybody in the government or have the experience of hearing what it's like working in the government? Where each of the departments are so jealous of each other that they won't share information? It's gotten a lot better than it used to be, but it used to be terrible. And it used to be like that with manufacturing companies where different departments wouldn't, wouldn't communicate because they didn't want to share their information even within itself because they're so competitive inside the company. Um, but yes, you can definitely see the improvement between what the file system would do and what the database would do, because all the data is in one place, which means you can now, you can get more information from the same amount of data. For example, you've got customer bins. Instead of having two different customer bins, you have one customer bin. That means you can get all the information you ever needed about the customers in one place. As supposed to have to go to shipping and ask for some of them, go to accounting and ask for some of it, go to sales and ask for some of it. It's all in one bin, so you can get more information because the data for everyone's shared in one place. Um, data is easier to be shared. In other words, you can share that one customer record between accounting, shipping, and sales. That means if the guy in sales updates the customer's information, the guy in shipping gets it right away. Instead of the guy having to enter it a second time or trying to match it or figure that out, it's all handled automatically. Um, it also controls data redundancy. Earlier we discussed how it could be bad. Oh, she's the one that ran away. She's the one that said it. Um, it could be bad that you have the same data in more than one place. Obviously, that's bad. And you might not realize why that's bad. 
if you don't have all the data in one place is because people can make mistakes. If it's all in one bin, that means you only need to modify the one piece of data. That means A, the data entry is more efficient. There's less prone for error, uh, less prone to data loss, those kind of things. Now, one of the advantages is balancing. Databases are, by default, usually structured in such a way that everybody within an organization gets to benefit from it. For example, where I work, we rolled out a new ERP system a few years ago. And it's the first time we've ever had the accounts working into the same data as the sales reps. And the management's able to connect and actually go find out what products have been selling the best without having to ask the sales guys, well, what did you guys sell the most of last week? Hang on, let me go run a report and then I'll, I'll tell you after I massage my numbers. Right? There's no number massaging anymore because the data is shared and balanced. Everybody has access to the same information. Mind you, with the security in the system, that doesn't mean they're going to have access to the same information. But the data is available. That means it can be made available to people. Security can be expanded. In other words, there used to be a time when, back to the AS400 and the old green dumb terminals, if, for example, the guy in shipping goes on vacation, of course, the product still has to be shipped. So they'd probably pull someone off from the sales department or reception or you know, grab a technician for a week to run the shipping system. Now. One of two things would happen. Either they'd create a new user for him in the shipping system, or you'd just give him the shipping guy's information, which is what used to tend to happen. So the shipping guy's gone on vacation, but he still shipped 36 packages and he did them all wrong while he was on vacation. Why? Because that inform his login information was given to someone else. He had all these weird data breaches um, because it was too much work to create users. It was too much work to give him permissions. Now with the modern systems, you'd go, oh, Mike is in sales, but the guy in shipping is going away for a week. We'll make Mike put stuff in boxes for a week. Click, he has access to the shipping system. And now we know who's shipping the stuff because Mike's doing it. When you're able to control the security at that level by just giving permissions to someone, it's fantastic. As opposed to before where essentially they had to create a whole new user for them because it was in a different system. Or in a different file, in a different department, different computer. Having a single source data structure allows you to have shared security. Significantly better. Excuse me. Um, another advantage of databases is you're able to write ad hoc queries. Now, what an ad hoc query means is this is something that they could never do even 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Let's age myself a little bit, 30 years ago. For example, the president of the company would walk down to the sales floor and say, I need to know how many copies of thingamajigger we sold to the Eastern Coast US in the last three weeks. With the old systems, how odd, what are the odds you think somebody would be able to come up with that number within a few minutes or even say an hour? probably non-existent. Nowadays, if he goes to, say, the database developer and says, I need to know this piece of information, and, you know, the proper chain of authority was followed, so, you know, they're not leaking data they're not supposed to, the, uh, the average database developer should be able to write that query in 15 minutes, and the president will have his information right away, as opposed to it taking three, four days for a strategic decision. It could be done in 15 minutes. Um, and the other advantage, yes. Because what would happen is they, everything was in files and the applications were designed for that data. Like you could look up a customer by phone number. And then you'd go, oh, okay, this is the customer. That's guy in sales. This is how many we sold, but they did actually ship. So then they'd take the report from sales, go to shipping, print a report from shipping for all the ones that are in the Eastern Coast and actually compare them by hand. It's all in one place. Um, it's the magic of how it goes. Um, there's also provides data independence, which means the structure of the data can change without having to change. You, know, you add a field, the application, the application UI doesn't care. It's in one place, 
the entire application has access to it, whether or not the code needs it, but the structure is safe and sound. Um, which is going to lead me to uh, talking about what I was talking about Walmart. Um, right now, Walmart is the leader for ad hoc data gathering, at least in the US. Uh, with my Thursday group, I played a guessing game for five minutes, but I don't have as much time with you guys. So. Nobody would guess Walmart. Um, up till about two years ago, and that's because they were told they're not allowed to do this anymore, you could walk into Walmart in the morning and buy a jar of cheese with, say, for four bucks. They, they'd be, their computers would be running in the background, collecting information about everything that sells through the day. And at noon, they'd run a report saying, Holy crap, we only sold six jars of cheese whiz all morning at these four locations. Drop the price. So out in the back, computer would print off a worksheet at noon saying, remove reduce price on these following items. The guy would walk in and change the stickers on it. And at the same time, the prices would change in the computers for the cash registers instantly. So that means you could walk into Walmart and the price of a given item would change up to three or four times a day. Real time. Which is not something that you see in Canada because it's actually against the law. <laughs> you know, like, except for gasoline. Don't ask me why, but apparently there's laws, computer, uh, consumer protection laws for retail, where they're not allowed to change the prices too many times. Like they're allowed to change the prices daily, but not three, four times a day. Um, basically, the price you, you agree to in the morning is the price you're going to pay at three o'clock. Um, and now they've started having the same laws in the states. That's you know, not as happening as much as it used to, but. Walmart used to be the king of ad hoc querying. Their managers would sit there and run reports all day to tune the contents of their stores. Which is why. Um, anybody here do groceries at Walmart? Did you ever do groceries at more than one Walmart? Not at more than one, but you've done it, right? Did you ever notice that the cheese isn't the same price in two different Walmarts? Or even better, one Walmart will carry Parquet and the other one carries Imperial? Now, you've never noticed that. Somebody said yes over there. Yeah. Uh, why? Because they run reports on a weekly basis to see what products sell well. So they all carry a bit of parquet and a bit of imperial. Uh, but some of the stores will notice nobody's buying parquet, but they're selling imperial by the bucket book. So they'll stop carrying parquet and carry imperial, and the other guy will do the opposite. Same thing for Loblaws. Loblaws at Carlingwood Mall, their cheese is usually 50 cents more than Loblaws here at College Square. Why? Because they run reports and they see what, what sells and how much they can get away with. The joy of data. There once was a time where all the stores sold everything for the same price. Why? Because they couldn't do that kind of information. Uh, I don't know if that's an advantage or a disadvantage, but, you know, such is life. Now, there are a few disadvantages to databases. Uh, one, the actual disk, the data on the disks is bigger. Because not only do you have the data in the files, you've got the metadata in there too. It doesn't take up huge amounts of room, but not only do you have the data, you have the metadata also that goes with it. That means that for every piece of information, you also have a little bit extra information that describes what this data is. It doesn't add tons of space, but it's still you know, a little bit bigger. Um, increases complexity. When you're designing a database, there's more things you got to take into account. Whereas before, somebody who was writing an application that used files could just shoot from the hip and go, this is what they need. Done, program, done, day, two days. Now what happens is when you design an application against a database and you need to make changes to the database, you have to consider the design of the data. Is it, are you following these rules? Are you following the rules that everybody agrees to? Um, Security, am I leaking data out the way it shouldn't be leaked out? Uh, how are backups going to get done? When everything was file-based, did they just backed up the files? You know, at midnight, all the applications would turn off. They'd make a backup. The next morning, every, you know, the, the applications come back up and everybody's happy. Backups happened overnight. Now with these systems that are live 24 hours a day, there's backup windows. Backing up is complicated. Instead of just modifying files, you've got to take the database server, Create a backup file and then back up that backup file. They can be big. Our primary database at work, which is not that big, is about six and a half gigs after it's dumped. That means every single night we're backing up six and a half gigs. Our, our database sits on Amazon on one of their uh, AWS servers. 
not in their data dedicated data service, but on one of the other things. And when we do a backup, where do we backup? Here in Ottawa. With Amazon, you pay for data coming out, don't pay for data going in. That means that every single night we're paying for six and a half gigs of data transfer. Fine, it's pennies, it's like three cents, but, okay? But it's like nothing, but now let's do this place six and a half gigs for a year, nightly basis, but some of our systems back up three times a day. Why? Because it's important. That means we're backing up 18 gigs every night. Now you just grab all these different backups and it gets, you know, it gets more complicated, it's bigger, there's more and more. You have to plan that into your strategy. And the other thing that's important, you have to plan for integrity. You got to make sure that your applications aren't going to go rogue. It's a little more complicated. If you had the old system where you had just a file-based program where a guy typed some stuff in, it would update the file. And if that application went south and corrupted a file, okay, we lost that one file, restored from backup, we're done. But it did not affect sales, it didn't affect accounting. Whereas now, because everything's in one place, if the application starts eating up data, you're affecting the whole organization. Thus, you have to have better integrity rules. Okay. Which leads me to greater impact of failure. Like I said, actually, I discussed it three seconds ago, right? If a single application would go down, congratulations, restored from backup, you lose a couple of hours worth of data and you're done. Nowadays, if the database gets corrupted, there's a huge impact. Everybody's affected. Let's say the user's table gets mute. Somebody does a Bobby Drop table. And all the tables go away. The user's table gets deleted out of the system. Nobody can log in anymore. Now we don't know what's connected to anything. And if the database server is designed properly, when you use the user table, it's going to take out all the data that's related to the user table too. Because, you know, you don't want to leave stuff behind before you do a proper cleanup and everything goes away. So if a failure happens, many people are affected as opposed to before where you had maybe, you know, the guy in shipping would get affected. Not as much impact. Um, and of course, makes recovery more difficult. If data can be updated by several users at the same time, and then something goes horribly wrong, how do you know what the correct state was for everyone? Which is why database servers have to be planned in such a way that you know multiple changes can't happen exactly at the same moment. They have to happen sequentially. There's planning involved. Okay. Time is all right. Eleven slides left to go, and from here on out, it's literally an info dump, terminology dump coming up. At least the good news is this is an info dump that's going to make more sense to everyone. Okay. The first one is what is a relation? Relation is a word you'll hear about all the time in database, and there's two words you hear a lot actually in database. There's relation and relationship. They're not the same thing, just so you know. Just because they sound the same, they're not the same thing. A relation is an object in the database that contains information. In other words, it contains rows that has data about an entity. Um, now, just so I can give you guys what the definition of an entity is. An entity is a thing. It's a thing. Literally, it's a thing. In this room, there's all kinds of entities. There are students, there's a prof, there's computers. Um, what else, I mean, there's equipment, there's all kinds of entities in this room. And a relation is made out of rows and columns. How many of you have used a spreadsheet? Okay, hopefully I usually get more than two hands for this one, right? Whether it's Excel or Google Sheets or that god awful product on Mac, whatever it's called, Numbers. Um, you know how things are organized in rows and columns? Right? You can picture the inside of a database being similar. So that a spreadsheet is the database. Each of the sheets, you know, spreading in multiple sheets, is a table, and then there's rows and columns inside of that. Now. Which always leads me to somebody say, well, why can't we just use something like Excel? <laughs> Can you imagine Amazon running off Excel? Right. Um, however, each of the columns 
And these are all in terminology. And then actually, one of the slides further down actually has a terminology substitute chart. Um, so a relation is an object in the database. It contains information about an entity. An entity is a thing. Whether a thing is a person or an event or a metaphysical object such as an order, um, which is something that exists but doesn't really exist. You know what I mean? Like if I say I created an order out in the air, the order doesn't really exist. It's not a thing. It's just it's a thing. God, I hate using the thing, 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 but it's a thing. It's an object. Um, columns contain data about the, uh, the attributes of the entity. Okay, so each of the columns, if I look back at this, right, pretend this is an entity. And each of the columns, these are things that go down, have attributes, a name and a data type. Those are attributes. There's other attributes, but those are the basic attributes. So, for example, if I say to help bring this concept a little closer, what are the attributes of a student? It's where people start shouting things out. Age, okay, sure. Hey? What? Oh, yeah, funny. Other information? Yeah. No, that's, you're getting metaphysical there. What was that over here? Student number, there we go. What else? Address, and? And uh, sure, the what institution you're in or you should be committed to. Okay, name. I was waiting for name. You know, actually, the first one gets shouted out. It was the last one shouted out. Um, but yes, those are all attributes of a student. A lot of those things apply to a teacher. Also, we have very similar attributes, right? We have a name and an address and what institute you've been committed to. We have an ID number of some sort. Mine's an employee ID. Yours is a student number, but it's the same thing essentially. Um, but those are essentially attributes in the data, which also map up to columns. Cells of a table hold a single value. So if you look at this here, this is a single cell. It holds the name Dan. All entries in a column going up and down are of the same kind. That means you don't mix say strings and dates right dates are a date names are a name sometimes you end up people get creative and they end up putting numbers in their name i feel bad for them but they chose to be called alex 26. why heck if i know but they're alex 26. um and for example if it's a solid number like an integer like a two-digit number why would you store strings in there? Therefore, all the values in a single column are of the same kind of information. Each column has to have a unique name, right? Person's name, their occupation, year of birth. If I had the word name here, name there, how would you know which one's the person's name? Therefore, database servers don't allow you to have columns of the same name, twice in the same table. You have the same name in more than one place, but not twice in the same table. Um, the order of rows and columns is unimportant. So in other words, you could have the occupation, year of birth, and the name after. That makes no difference. What order, does this make a difference? What order the columns are in? Totally irrelevant. It can be in any order. Same thing with the, the rows. Who cares what order they're in? Because when you're running queries, which is something I teach you guys later, you can change the order anyways. The order of the rows in the database is irrelevant unimportant. Who cares? And the last rule is no two rows can be identical. So if I were to put in and I tell you to go change the year of birth for Dan Cobbler, how do you know which one you're supposed to modify? Identical, let's say they're identical, but for argument's sake, let's say they're not identical for now. Okay. How do we know which one we're supposed to modify? We don't. Because the rows are not unique. So, 
no two rows may be identical. So these are the basic rules of engagement. So, so you know, a relation is made out of rows and columns. Columns have a name. Each cell is a single data point. You can't have, you can repeat that data point multiple times, but each one only has one value. Okay? Now, the last thing, the other piece of terminology, and I think I approach it later in the slideshow, but I'm not 100% sure, is a single collection of data, like this one row here, this Dave Sampler 83. It sounds like a really bad username. Dave Sampler 83 is known as an instance. This instance. Frank Bricks 55 is another instance. These are all instances that make up the contents of, say, an employee's relation. That's the terminology on that. Okay. Now, the other piece of terminology you're going to see is keys. And we're going to actually talk about this later on. When we're, so this is like, there's going to be a review later. Not a review, but it's covered in more detail later. Keys. A key is one or more columns of relation that is used to identify a row. In other words, when we refer to a student, what would be a unique identifier for each of you? Student ID. Now, I've had people say, well, how about my SIN number? If you're Canadian. But I said, that only applies if you're a Canadian citizen. Right? If you're not from Canada and you're here on a student visa, you don't have a SIN number. You might have a passport number or a student visa number, but you don't have a SIN number, or at least not that I know of, unless things have changed recently. But, you know, you don't have a SIN number. But you all have a student number. So that's a key that's used to uniquely identify you at the school. Now, there are certain keys that can be unique or non-unique, depending what kind of key you're talking about. And I'm going to send out some definitions in the next couple of slides. I'm going to, you see there's uh, five on there. I'm going to talk about all five. The first one I'm going to talk about is composite, candidate, and primary keys. Okay. Lots of words, and I'm going to cover this in detail later in the term. However, here's the basic. A composite key is one that's made up of more than one thing. For example, first name and last name combined could be used as a key to uniquely identify you. It's actually a really terrible choice, but you could use that. Or you could use first name, last name, Date of birth combined. That's called the composite key because you're using three pieces of information to make a unique identifier. A candidate key are keys that could be used possibly to uniquely identify something. So if you remember a few moments ago, I talked about how the SID number, Canadian SID number, or an American SSN number could be used to uniquely identify you. However, the reason why it's considered a candidate key and not an actual primary key is that until the design is finalized, it's a candidate, as in it could be used as a unique identifier. It doesn't mean it will be, but it could be used. So in other words, when you start brainstorming on ways to uniquely identify someone, you go, well, what could I use to uniquely identify someone? Oh, I guess I could use their SIN number, but not everybody has a SIN number. Oh, could I use their visa, a passport number? And it's getting actually rare to find a Canadian that doesn't have a passport anymore. But there are still people that don't have passports. Therefore, you can't use a passport number as a unique identifier. And since passport numbers in Canada are sequential, and American passport numbers are also sequential, there you have a chance that you'll have two people with the same passport number, but from two different countries. Therefore, it's a candidate key. Isn't, we might be able to use this as a source of uniqueness, but you know we don't know yet because we're not done the design process. So that's a candidate key. These are things that could be used to identify something uniquely, but not yet. Now, in the end, holy crap, that's a terrible noise. That's the Coke machine. 
compressor's toast. The primary key in the end is the candidate key that's chosen as the key that will actually be used as the unique identifier. So picture this as a competition for the keys. And you've got four different pieces of information that could be the key. And then we have a tournament arc. And everybody battles on who's going to be the primary key. And in the end, one merges it victorious. Because it can only be one. Um, unless it's a composite. Then you know, you got like a mutant. Uh, which is actually really bad. Um, and I explained during the term why that's bad. But essentially, the primary key is the one piece of information used to uniquely identify a row. Now, remember earlier how I wrote a second version of Dan Cobbler 75, and there was no way to actually really know which one it was? Okay, so he's back from the dead. And... The way to resolve this kind of a problem is, we, we let's look at this data for a second. Is there anything in here we can use as a primary key? The only way to create a primary key with the current data that we have is actually create a composite key, right? Made up of all three columns. Which means we can't have two Dan Cobblers that are born in 75. Because that's what the system says. Can somebody shut the back door? I'm getting so much echo from the back door I can't hear myself. Yes, please. Um, so right now, the way this, this doesn't work, there's no candidate key that's going to be successful. They all fail. So which leads us to something called a surrogate key. And we talk about this later in the term also, but a surrogate key is made up data. We're going to invent data. We're going to create information. And it is a column that has a unique database server assigned value. So we add a column up here called, I don't know, employee ID. Now we're fabricating data. Why? Yes. No, no, made up. We're making up data. We're making up data that's going to made up, be made out of metadata. All right? And we're creating a new column. And now we have a unique value for every row. And every row is unique unto itself. Why? Because there's a value in this column that's being created as we go. This is known as a, a surrogate key. Uh, you might also find it on the internet called a synthetic key. Do you have a question or are your hands just doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one and four, yeah. Well, yeah, but for now, this data doesn't have that information. So based on what we are given, which is half the problem being a database designer, is you have to work with what you're given, unless you get to be magical and create a synthetic key or a surrogate key, depending which terminology you want to use. We don't know what the year, uh, what the month and day is. But hey, who knows? I mean, you might end up with a situation where it's really, really weird. I mean, literally, when I was born, there was a girl that was born three minutes after me. Same last name, same first name, except it was spelled like a girl. L literally, rooms next to each other. And I have met her in high school. But we, she used to go, she was from out of town. So, you know, I mean, even that's possible. That'd be another Dan Goudreau born in that year within the same date. It's not impossible. Uh, there once was a time, if you look at Dan Goudreau in Ottawa, there was 14 of us. Why? Goudreau is a common last name, and Daniel's pretty much the most de facto French name. So we create what's called a surrogate key. This is a new column that's created. Its only purpose in life is to make each row unique. Um, I think next week I talk about the pros and the cons of surrogate keys. Um, and <coughs> there's a bit of an example on this slide with this weird notation. Um, 
later on, actually, uh, next week, actually cover what this notation is, if I remember right. Um, but essentially, this is an entity. These are the columns. And as you can see right here, um, this one's a compound key. The property ID is a synthetic key. So what would happen is, if with the street, city, property, and postal code, you could have possibly have two units in one address with two different owners, and you have no way to know unless you include the owner along for the ride. That means you have to make the entire row unique. And what happens if this guy owns two properties at the same address? Because often when you look at a register for an address for property ownership, they don't differentiate unit A from unit B. They'll just have the same address with a different registry number, which is where the property ID comes in. So they added an extra column here to make it unique. Surrogate keys are usually short numeric and they never change. That means that once you've assigned a value to a row, you'd never change it. That becomes its number forever. Such as your student number here at the college. I had a student last term who had a student number that had one less digit than everybody else. If it gives you an idea, he was a return student. He was at school here 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was, you know, X number of students less that had gone through the system. So his student number actually had one extra zero at the beginning than yours did. It was kind of nifty. I hadn't seen such a short student number in, in a long time. They're sequential. They go up. Your student numbers are sequential. Odds are um, there's a good chance that if you registered at almost at the same time as someone else, you could be in the same class as a student number that's only one digit apart. Well, I've seen that happen. Often it's when they're siblings. I've had a set of twins come into class and their digit, their student numbers were one digit apart. You know. Um, so a surrogate key makes it ideal for a primary key. Why is it ideal for a primary key? Because it's unique for every row. Therefore, the value is never duplicated in the database. Therefore, if it's never duplicated, it makes it a very good candidate. And since it can't be duplicated, it means it's always unique, which makes it a primary key. Which means if it's unique and a primary key, we can use that value to always find the record we're after. So if I go back to, hey, I want to update Dan Cobbler's year of birth because somebody made a mistake and it shouldn't have been 75 it should have been 65 for the second one they pull up the person's record they go oh instead of updating dan cobbler's record i'll update record number four and change his date to 65. before there was no way to know which one was the unique row now there is we we because we give it a unique id each row is unique that is a surrogate key that is also a primary key. What's my time like? Okay. I'm skipping that slide. I'll get back to it next week. All right. There's a notation for relations, which I should have had the slide earlier. Here's the notation for a relation. This is actually from chapter five in the book. You guys aren't reading up to chapter five, but I decided. You know, you should know about it now. The notation of a relation is the relation, the primary key and non-primary columns, common delimited. In other words, we have a customer table. The ID is the primary key, it's it's underlined, comma, name, comma, email, comma, phone, comma, address, comma, postal code, comma, salary, comma, comma, comma. And if we had or actually, it wouldn't be salary because it's a customer, but if it was an employee, we could have employee, comma, bracket, ID, under, which is underscored, comma, name, comma, start date, comma, department, comma, salary, comma, you know, whatever else. That's called the notation for a relation. Um, you'll be using this notation significantly in some of your labs going forward. Uh, just try to get comfortable with it. It's not a hard notation. Um, this is the first step towards database design is learning this notation. This notation has been around for 40 years, just so you know. It's been around forever. Why? Because it works. Why reinvent the wheel?
Okay, I've got 15 minutes. Actually, technically five, but there's no one else after this so, in this room. Equivalency terms. I'm not going to go through them. This is a slide. Uh, this, just remember this slide. And essentially, as we go through this term, you want to refer back to this slide. When we talk about a relation, so we're talking about the, the modeling side. A relation is also known as a table. The old file system would be known as a file. And when we're talking about concepts, it's an entity type. A tuple is the same thing as a row or a record. An attribute is the same thing as a column or a field. These are all terminology that are interchangeable. Um, probably the most important grid you'll see all term. So, you know, make a copy of it. It's in the PowerPoint that you can download, so don't bother typing it now. You can just copy paste it. I was watching you start getting me to type out the whole table. Okay, almost as good. Um, okay, well, this is for so you guys can get ready for the lab this week. This last couple of slides. Okay, ERDs. ERDs are diagrams. They're pictures. Um, this documentation used to describe how the internals of a database is. Um, there's a few different kinds of ERDs. And there's a conceptual, which also is sometimes called a logical. And then there's the physical diagram. The conceptual slash logical is a high level picture that shows how things are described and how they're connected. The physical one actually describes what it would look like inside the database server. So that has like the proper data types, the proper relations, and the rules, and the all the proper naming conventions and all that jazz. The conceptual slash logical just shows the gross objects and roughly what they're made out of. Um, the data model can be reviewed by the end user and the person responsible for the physical database design. Often you'll have a person that does the, the conceptual diagrams and hand them off to a data architect. Um, you'll sometimes see job postings for data the database designers and then database architects. They're the two sides of the same coin. A lot of us in the industry do both jobs. However, there are two different jobs. There's the ones that do the concept. They're the ones that talk to the end users, figure out how everything's supposed to be organized, draw a pretty picture for the end users so they understand how their data actually is. And they take that picture, they give it to a database architect, and then he rips it to pieces to make it make sense to the database server. And he makes his own little diagram. And there's a huge difference between the two. Um, and it's really useful for the person creating the data model. I'm actually going to put up a, a link to a YouTube video to help you guys see how it's done. Um, but you'll see. Um, what is an ERD? It's a conceptual model that represents the data used in an organization and the relationships between the data. And it's a graphical representation of the proposed database. So in other words, it's part of the design process where uh, anybody here ever do, ever do any kind of like, graphic art? Sometimes? No. No artists in the room. Okay. Anybody here ever write creatively? Do any kind of creative writing? Okay. Anybody here ever do mods for a game? Okay. Different hands. Same hands sometimes. Okay. You know how you'll do a mock-up first? Maybe, if you're organized. Or you're that guy who just wings it. You either do a mock-up and then you show it to other people, say, does the mock-up make sense before I go and spend hours creating my mod? Or, you know, here's a mod, here's an outline of my document that I'm planning to write or my story. Here's a story outline. This is similar to a story outline or a mock-up, depending on what it is you're working on. Um, basically put, it gives you a rough idea of how everything's connected, and it makes a pretty picture. It's made out of entities and events. Entities are peoples and places and things. Uh, entities can also be events. You placed an order or you applied for a loan. That's an event. The application goes into a database. Now it's a thing. It's an application. But while you're applying, it's an event. Something happened. Uh, attributes for events and entities, such as customer names and dates, those are things you include on the ERD. Attributes are single-valued fact, such as a student number, student name, your email address, your postal code, et cetera, et cetera. 
that's a single, for each a single one of you, for each and every one of you, you each have one student number, you each have one date of birth. So that's a single value, and that's an attribute of you. So when you actually diagram, you won't have all those attributes. Okay. Relationships are found between entities and events. So in other words, things connect other things. For example, here's two entities that apply to you guys at college. Students, courses, right? Students are related to courses because you take the course. That's a relationship. You, there's one course and many students. One course, possibly many teachers. And how is, how is this all connected? Probably through a section. For example, there's four or five sections of CST 8215. Five. So, you know, there's one course, a bunch of students, a bunch of teachers, and then there's sections. The section is a connection between the student, the course, and the teacher. Those are the relationships. Examples on here is an employee works for a department or a customer places an order. Those are relationships. Uh, business rules should be taken into account. In other words, every employee must belong to at least one department. Or if you're like me, you belong to three different departments. The joy. Okay. An ERD should capture all required information. It should make sure that data appears only once in the database design. In other words, you shouldn't repeat information more than once. That's part of the design process. You want to make sure nothing gets repeated. You should not include anything that is derived. For example, do you need to store both a person's date of birth and their age? Think about it. Do you need to store both a person's age and their date of birth? No, because how do you know how old someone is? Now minus date of birth, it gives you years, days, months, and minutes. Okay? Okay, so date of birth is March 7th every year. That means on March, every single night, a job has to run and update all the records and add a year to everybody's date the day after their birthday. Why do that? Why add that extra complexity? Let's say, no, you're actually adding time. I mean, the computer programmer can write a chunk of codes that calculates the person's age automatically. The guy who writes one line of code. If you want to see it in PHP, it'd be literally uh, date minus interval, you know, bang. Or date diff function, actually. They finally gave us a date diff function. It tells you the difference between the two. One line of code. And nobody needs to do maintenance. There's no ongoing nightly jobs. That's called the derived value. It's just like for an order. When you buy something. And I got to be careful when I say this because a lot of systems actually store this information for performance reasons. Uh, but on smaller ordering systems, you don't store the line totals. You don't store the order totals. Why? How do you calculate the line total? Quantity times price, maybe minus a discount gives you the line total. You can calculate it every time. There's always a risk, you know, that something goes wrong and the, the calculated total gets damaged somewhere along the way. Same thing with the order total. How do you calculate the total of an order? Add up each of your line items. It gives you your order total, or at least your order subtotal. That's called derived data. It's something you don't store in the database unless you have a really good reason to do it. Um, for a company where, like, where our system doesn't actually store any of this information because we get maybe 10 orders a day. Mind you, 10 orders a day for us is like 50 grand. But 10 orders a day is nothing. Amazon, on the other hand, might store a lot of this derived data because how many orders a second does Amazon get? Right? They'll store this extra information for performance reasons for the nightly batch jobs when they're running the nightly reports of you know this is what sold well and what this one didn't sell well. There is a difference between the two. But normally you don't store the derived data unless you have a really good reason to. Um, and then you want to arrange the data model in a logical manner. So that in the end is you just want to make it look like it makes sense. Um, I was hoping to actually have time to do a quick one on the board, but I'm not because, yeah. So here's your what you guys have to do. 
by next week. Okay? Buy the book. And um, or acquire the book. Let's go with that phrase. Okay? Make sure it's the fourth edition. Uh, the chapters changed order between chapter the third and the fourth. So when I tell you to read, if you have the older copy, it's not going to work. Read chapters three and four. It's a lot of reading, but it's actually, I wish I had the book here with me. Um, no, it's the other one. But you can see the book, the pages are half white. So it sounds like a lot of reading, but it's not. Because there's these huge margins all the way around it. Um, so chap read chapter, yes. I'll answer that once the recording stopped. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. Read chapters three and four. The hybrids. You should try to do them on a weekly basis. The first hybrid's a bit of a fluff hybrid. It's a bit of a history lesson. But you still need to do it. But if you look at hybrid one and hybrid two, hybrid two will get you definitely ready for the lab this week. Because hybrid two is a demo of, a, of me drawing an ERD. I'm using the computer, but you know I'm drawing an ERD and I'm explaining my thought process as I'm going through it. Um, and obviously you're going to be working on lab too, which is, you know, drawing an ERD. Um, which is why, you know, watch hybrid one, answer the questions. And to answer the questions, you've got to click on the name of the hybrid. So there's the hybrid. And go begin. Okay? I had someone ask me how to answer the questions of the hybrid. That's how. <coughs> hey? Yeah, well, no. This one here, I'd rather you do hybrid two before you do hybrid one because this will get you ready for the lab. This one's a history lesson. Just get it done before the end of the term. Okay? This covers a bit of the background of where things came from and who made what, when, and in what order. So if I just threw out names of companies along the way where, you know, Oracle used to do the stupid shit like this in the past, well, this is when Oracle started doing the stupid shit. That kind of history lesson. Uh, it's useful information. It's not going to be on the exam. But it is worth 1% of your final grade. And some of those people that like, you know, getting that A+, plus, that 1% might be the difference between 89 and 90. Just saying it's happened where somebody didn't do a hybrid and it was that 1% they needed. Yes? Pardon? You're currently week one and a half. Next week you'll be week two and a half. And three. You're somewhere between week one and week two. I covered half the material of week two with you today as, as part of my rush presentation. I will be posting links to the full version of lecture one. You guys got all the essential information. The other guys just got lots of extra fluff. And the kibitzing by one of my students that kept kibitzing during the whole lecture and throw me off. Um, so yes, do hybrid two before Thursday. The video is like nine minutes, maybe 15 minutes tops. It'll give you a good preparation of what you have to do with Cheryl. Hey? This Thursday, yeah, day after tomorrow. 15 minutes. Go sit at home, pour yourself a coffee or, or whatever it is you want to drink, whether it's alcoholic or not, depending on whether or not you can drink something alcoholic. Whether you're 19 or you're allowed to. Take your pick, whatever. Knock yourself out and watch it. It'll give you at least a bit of an idea of what I want you to do. Uh, you get two tries. Each hybrid gets two tries. It keeps your best rate of the two tries. So you can go through it once, and if you end up with like a nine out of ten, like ninety percent, then you try a second time, get eighty percent, you'll still get ninety percent. No, I don't even have a set due date. Okay, I'm going to stop my recording so I can answer that question.